him, went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. In your mind, try to picture him standing there. And he has this audience watching him. What's he going to do next? He's never performed a miracle in his life. He's only been a water boy, a water boy for Elijah. And then the passage says, Verse 13, he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Now, the word Lord has been read several times here and every letter is a capital. The Jewish people would have been very sensitive to that name, Yahweh, the unspoken name. And those two roots put together form the word Yahweh. It's like you have Standard Oil. And they wanted to advertise their brand name, Standard Oil, S-O. And so they, in a corrupt way, spelled S-O. E-S-S-O. S-O. They conveyed their name. They put together a word with their logo. But they were not the first to do it. Heaven did it first and took that marvelous word of height and depth and breadth and width that encompasses the person and character and conduct of our God, the self-sustaining one, the redeeming one, the revealing one, Yahweh. Jehovah God is the one who came that day. And he is present in all of your services. He is the power behind every ministry. He is the one to whom we look and to whom we focus. Now I continue. Verse 15. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Now, Keep that in your mind, and may I simply recite Acts 1.1. The former treaties have I written unto thee, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And my title tonight is A Tough Act to Follow. You know, it'll be difficult to do some things. Let's say you have trouble writing a grocery list. And Shakespeare is in his study writing Hamlet, the most famous play in the world. And he comes to the most famous section of that play, to be or not to be. What a commentary, by the way, on human depravity, because that soliloquy speaks of the doubt of the human heart and the fear of man's soul, the failure of man's will, and the trap of condemnation. A gifted preacher wrote a reply to Shakespeare on faith's reply to doubt. But that's the most famous literary piece in all the English language. And Shakespeare starts it, to be or not to be, and he hands you the pen, he says, please finish it. I would say, sir, I'm going home early today, I'm sick. Let's say that there is a world-class pitcher pitching a perfect game. It's the ninth inning. And you, with your physical dexterity, cannot chew chewing gum and walk down the steps at the same time. Hands you the ball and the glove and says, finish it. A handle is busily writing Messiah. Hallelujah, course first few chords, and you can't carry a tune. I, have, I, can, I can carry one, but I don't know where to deliver it. And he hands you the quill, and he says, finish it. And here the risen Christ says to Northwest Baptist Mission, I paid the price for world evangelization, for man's salvation, I started the work. Finish it. 
That's the book. That's the book. You say, I think I'd rather pitch that ball game. It'd be easier. Or write that play. Or do that music. It'd be easier. But you know, we have an arrangement that others don't have. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live with the faithful Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life which I now live, it's Christ. He's doing it. He's in charge. Now, just a quick overview. We're first introduced to Elijah and very few characters in any writing, any literature are introduced as he was introduced. He is introduced full grown at the peak of his power, facing a wicked apostate king, announcing the Lord God. Use that wonderful name before whom I stand. And as I said last night, he took the key of faith, locked the windows of heaven, put the key in his pocket, and walked away. I like that. I like that. That's not my style, but I like that. Would I could do that? I, I, that's thrilling. He, he not only could lock heaven's windows, but he could open them. He could pray down fire from heaven. And I think that was more than just the kind of fire that you and I see. Because the fire you and I see, the kind we use for a barbecue roast or something like that, or for a bonfire for marshmallows, it will not burn rock. This fire came down from heaven like an atomic explosion. What a man of prayer. He could raise the dead. And in his last act in the Old Testament history, he who challenged the king would now challenge death and ascend to glory apart from dying. Then we find him later on Transfiguration Mount. What a man. But one day, you know one of the greatest things we find about him, one of the greatest things we find about him is when he was out preaching, going from one place to another, he had Bible colleges, always looking for young men. He saw a young man plowing with a 12th yoke of oxen. The 12th yoke of oxen. Now, I've heard a lot of explanations of that, but let me try to, let me try to help you a little bit. The 12th yoke of oxen. We're talking about a land where the rock and the ground is about the same. It's very difficult to plow. Very difficult to plow. It's a wooden plow, one handle. It's very long. The left hand holds the handle, the right hand has a stick with a sharp object, a goad to move the oxen along. And you have 12 teams, one behind the other. The first one just barely breaks the surface. Second one, a little deeper, a little deeper, a little deeper, a little deeper. Now, who gets to plow the 12th yoke? That'd be like, you know, having a convertible with a top down on a dirt road with a caravan driving in front of you. So he has a 12th yoke of oxen. Who would be happy about that? The only person I can think of would be your grandmother. She'd get excited and say, my son drives a 12th yoke of oxen. To help you a little bit more, I like, to get, I like for you to have a take-home box. That's why I tell these little stories. You can take this stuff home with you. And you can preach it Sunday. Your wife won't mind hearing it twice. She can take a nap Sunday morning. There was a time when, when, when McDonald's first moved to our city that it seemed like every, every teen in our junior high department got a job at the McDonald's near our church. My son was one of them. I was, he, and he came home thrilled. He came home so thrilled. He came home one night, he was so, I couldn't believe how they could motivate young people to work. If they needed 40 young people for the week, they'd hire 70. And then if you were goofing off, they'd send you home. But they could motivate you. They're always giving awards and recognizing people. He came home one night, he was so excited, had a little paper cap like soldiers wore during World War II. A little paper cap, you know, it fits and you could fold it flat. Paper cap had a small gold band around it. He said, Mom, Dad, I got a raise and a promotion. And I said, Son, what was your raise? He said, A half penny an hour. I tried, you know, look sober. 
I said, what's your promotion? He said, I am the assistant manager of French fries. I said, son, your mother and I are very, very proud of you, but I wouldn't say anything around the church about this if I were you. <laughs> Half an hour, sent to manage your french fries. Twelfth yoke of oxen. Twelfth yoke of oxen. And here is, my hand that's getting locked, excuse me. Can lock heaven's windows and open them. Pray down fire, raise the dead. He said, son, I want you to work with me. Come on. I mean, Elijah, are you, do you have heart in the arteries? Is there something wrong up there? You're going to use a plowboy? Twelve yoke plowboy? And the plowboy first disappointed me. He said, let me tell mom and daddy goodbye. Elijah says, that's fine. And then there's a wonderful thing. He chops up his axe and builds a fire and slaughters his oxen and has a going away dinner for mom and dad. I'll tell you one thing. It's hard to go back to plowing when you burn your plow and eaten the oxen. <laughs> and I'm getting into something called Timothy's. And as a dear brother, he has a ministry on making Timothy's, and you're going to think he paid me to say what I'm saying tonight. But one of the greatest things that can happen in your ministry when you first begin is begin to make a Timothy. That is with God's enabling. A Timothy. My heart has been crushed again and again and again as I've received mission letters that were tearful from aged, aging missionaries who've waited until they were 65 and 70 and then put a PS on their prayer letter, pray that somebody will take over our work. There can be circumstances where it happens that way and you couldn't change it, but I want to tell you something. We have missed something on not beginning to mentor young men in the early days of our ministry and pour our life into the lives of others. You never lose by giving. You lose by being self-centered and keeping. So what does Elisha get to do? He's the water boy. Now you can give him an title you want to, he's a water boy. And at times nobody can, uh, they don't even know his name. Somebody said, who is it? He said, that's the one that pours water on the hands of Elijah. That's what's his name. So here's old what's his name. Now he's never done a miracle. Hasn't had a college course in how to do it. And suddenly the man that everybody knows, he's on, he's on every heart and every lip in the nation. Some hate him, some love him, but everybody knows him. And he, in the most dramatic way, left earth for heaven, and the mantle falls in the water boy's hands. And to use the New Testament language, son, you finish it. You've got 16 miracles to do. That brings me to the heart of my message tonight. And please don't let those words fall carelessly. Go for the Timothys. Go for the Timothys. It'll do more to strengthen. I have never lost by pouring my life in young men. Not long ago, and this man's called me several times, he's dying of cancer. He wanted to plant a church came to my office. I was pastor and professor. And he told me what he had wanted to do. I said to him, how can I help you? He started crying. He said, you're the first man who acted like it could happen. Everybody else just said, don't think you can do it. And you were saying, and, and I, just, I just did what I thought I should do. But you can never lose by pouring your life in young Timothys. And one of the greatest weaknesses of my generation has been the failure of good men to do that. Failure of good men to do that. But, finish the task. Now, what do we have here? Let's picture this man standing there, Elisha, the water boy, with a mantle in his hand. 
his master is gone, he has three problems. Number one, he has a problem he cannot solve doing a miracle. He has a place he cannot go to cross the Jordan. Has people to whom he cannot minister. He has a group of ministerial students just waiting for him to fail. Have you ever noticed that some people in Christian work are far happier if you have a bad day than a good day? I mean, if you walk up to them and say, and they say, how's your work? They say, well, it's not doing too well. Well, isn't that, that's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> they don't say it like that, but their body language says that. If you just say to them, well, we had 15 people converted Sunday. I'm getting ready to baptize them as soon as they go through the candidate class. Oh, really? You did? Where did it come from? Was there a church split somewhere around? I mean, the, the, today, today there seems to be an apathy in the land that has the power of steel to bind. And our national anthem among the Christian community seems to be that God is now on vacation and nothing can take place. So those three categories probably fit everybody here in one way or another. I ask you, but don't answer aloud. You got a problem you can't solve? You got a place and you know God wants you to go there, but you can't go? You got some people to whom you should give the gospel, but you just somehow feel you can't do it or you do it without power? It takes only a minute or two to get through these thoughts. So I trust God will use them to speak to your heart. You know what happened in the biblical case. He smote those waters. The river divided. He walked across, and the students bowed before him and said, Elijah's God is with this man. Years ago, in the beautiful Chandler Valley, Virginia, a very wealthy farm family, beautiful farm, lush and green, producing a great income, Young girl goes to Moody Bible Institute, commits herself to missions, and she says to her family and her church, I've been called to go to India. Now this went on even when she was a teen. She said that before she ever went to Moody. But then when she finished and she came home, she was about 27 at this point. She'd been accepted by Baptist Med. And her older brothers and sisters, she was a baby girl in the family, they said to her, Rachel, Rachel, you can't go. Mama and Daddy need you. We've all agreed that if you will not go and you will stay here, that you can have the farm, you and whoever you marry. But you are to look after Mother and Daddy. Now, the, the, isn't it nice when your siblings know what you're supposed to do and decide it for you? And have it all planned before you even think about it or told. And to speed up this story, they did something else. They had power, political power, in that little church. So the pastor said, Rachel, I can't commission you. Your responsibility is to mom and dad. Well, my predecessor in my Winston-Salem pastorate happened to be on Men Missions board and knew the situation. So he said to Rachel, just join our church. We understand what's happening, and we will help you. We'll support you. And that took place. So when I became the pastor, she was one of my members and became one of my dearest friends. My wife and I loved her dearly. Now, what happened? God said to her, I have called you. And thankfully, her mom and dad had that kind of discernment. They said, Rachel, but God has called you. Yes, we're sickly. Yes, we're old. But God can take care of that. So she went on to India. How did the story unfold? Well, she was in India for, I remember when she was in India 22 years, she'd only been home on furlough all total about one year. She stayed once 14 years without coming back. She didn't have a lot of supporting churches, mom and dad and our church. That was about it, maybe one or two more. Now, we got to know each other, we could talk, and I, I wrote her one day, you say, Mom and Dad, 
They got better when she went to India. They took care of her prayer letter monthly. And their support and our church support was basically her support. And when mom and dad observed their 75th wedding anniversary, the Roanoke Times in their Sunday supplement had the picture on the front page. Dad was 97 and mom was 94. I wrote Rachel and I said, dear Rachel, please come home. Your mother and daddy want to go to heaven, and if you don't leave India and come home, they'll never get to go to heaven. <laughs> we could talk a long time about Rachel. She and my wife were great friends. But I saw what God could do. Rachel couldn't handle it, and the mission board couldn't handle it, and my predecessor couldn't handle it, but he who is Jehovah Yahweh, he could handle it. And there's no problem in the Intermountain West that God cannot handle. We're talking about the God of the Bible. You got a place you can't go? You know, sometimes it's just tough to go some places. I've been, now I know, I, I, I'm probably sharing a private secret. It's never happened to any of you, but I've been out on visitation and people weren't at home and I was very happy about it. <laughs> I've done all I can do. I'm here and they're not home. So I'm glad to go. Got that call made quickly. Got a place you need to go tonight, but you don't want to go. When my wife and I were working with the Foreign Mission Board, we had two couples to come and present themselves as candidates to go to the Torags of Africa. Torags. Unusual people. They're not, the, they're not black people, they're Caucasian, but they're usually fairly dark complexion because of intermarriage, because of the sun. Prior to this present era, they were very wealthy people, they, uh, each, they were fierce warriors. About uh, five million of them, maybe two to five million, no one knows exactly how many, across northern Africa. Their wealth in gold and silver, diamonds and cattle. But they, they were nomads, they're constantly traveling. They were Muslim people, but the men, not the women, wore a veil. They're the different sect of Islam. And their symbol was the cross, the cross, the cross of Agadez. So it's possible that somehow there was a Christian witness that went apostate. But it's intriguing. But you have two couples, all four MKs, that grew up in Africa. They know Africa. And they're called of God to go to the Torah. Well, the senior missionaries... The senior missionaries, now this, this is an in-house sermon tonight, okay? The senior missionaries got together and said, this is foolish. You can't do that. So two of the couples went out to camp for two or three weeks with the Torag and to prove it couldn't be done and came back and said, it can't be done. Well, usually a mission board will bow to the senior missionaries on a field. And the board bowed. They said, you can't go. My wife and I were the only people involved with these couples that spent all of our time with them. We had an apartment there at the home office. And so we were like mom and dad to them. So they come to us crying, literally crying, men and women, all four people. God's called us, but we can't go. So what should we do? Well, the Lord gave me wisdom to say the right thing. And I give God all the credit. I, 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 I only use this kind of illustration when I can't vouch for somebody else's statement about it. But I said, listen, you really don't have a problem. You, you've been called to do it. Have you been called to do it? Yes. They each, I asked each one, you've been called? Yes. Well, we, we believe that God's able, don't we? They said, yes. But they said, we can't go. Well, I said, wait a minute, who called you to go? Did this board ask you to go? No. Well, it's not their business what God wants you to do right now. Your business right now is to be obedient and humble and submissive. First thing you gotta do is get your support. And since you're all MKs, I, I just believe you can get it with them here. And they did. 
And then it doesn't make any difference how well you speak French. It's the rule of this mission. You've got to take a year of language. Everybody has to do it. Just two years. You've got two years. Don't you think God can work this out in two years? They started to smile. And I know what they were thinking. Well, you may be right, but I don't know. What happened in those two years? A drought hit Africa. One area had no rain for 17 years. The mighty Niger River, you could walk across it. Once, ocean-going vessels could travel it. And the Torag, his total culture and economy, was absolutely destroyed. And rather than living in a desert, he had to come into town. He was so humble that the Bella tribe that had been his slave abandoned him, said, we'll not be slaves to beggars. And my wife and I had the joy. That board had been so insistent that these kids wouldn't go that they put one couple in one language school in, Af in France and the other couple in another language school about a thousand miles away so they couldn't compare notes with each other on how to get there. So we went to both language schools and had the joy of telling those young couples, God has worked it out in God's way. You don't have to go to the desert. He brought the Torah into the city. And they cried again with tears of joy. They said, to be honest, Dr. Martin, we were kind of afraid to go anyway. Oh, God is the way maker. What is the passage in John? I am the way. Hold us, the blood sprinkle away. And what is that great word for deity, the Messiah in Micah? It's capitalized in the German Bible. I would that our English Bible had it in capitals. It's the word breaker, breaker. That's the shepherd that goes before the sheep and breaks up all the briars and the brambles and picks up the sharp rocks. He is the breaker. He's gone before us. He's the way maker. He's the door opener. No man can shut it. And then there's that last thought. Is, is there somebody you couldn't witness to? You try, but you can't. Any pastor faces that. Maybe somehow you just do something stupid or somebody else does, and you get blamed for it. And the people look at you and think, well, if you're a Christian, the world's full of them. If you're a preacher, you know, and you, you want to witness, but you can't. You just don't know how to do it. Something has to happen to change that. I would that I had more time, but we've had enough time. I, I just want to share one little thought with you about that. God can turn hearts around like you would never believe. I've seen him change the entire atmosphere of a church from Sunday morning to Sunday evening. From Sunday night to Wednesday night. People that curse me and ridicule me have said to me with tears, would you preach my wife's funeral? I have more confidence in you than they preach in town. Huh. I'm thinking that wasn't that way last year. God is able. I close with this. Finish the job. He'll handle the problem. He's a way maker. And he will give you a ministry. 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 That's his job. He will give you a ministry. In the darkest town in this state or in Colorado or New Mexico, he give you the ministry. Down in Georgia, in a little, little small village town, most houses with outdoor plumbing, a boy named Bob got converted. He's just a good old boy, a Georgia cracker, bonafide redneck. His wife was already saved, but she'd never been developed in discipline. And what a moment. They got on fire for God. A man came by preaching on mission. He went up, he said, I'll go. And if I was he talked to you a little bit, you need to go to Bible school. So he goes. And they get to support, and he joins a wonderful mission board. And they said, because of your age, because of your age, we're going to put you looking after our camp and certain country in Central America. I better not be too, too definite about some things here tonight. I don't want to sound like I'm hurting somebody's testimony. 
But they put him in charge of a camp, and they had one week of camp a year. 52 weeks in a year, but they had one week of camp. Now, your job will be to keep the grass mowed and the buildings painted and make sure everything's okay when camp has come. And in his heart, he's dying. He thinks, God called me to preach. I can learn enough Spanish. I can do it. I can do it. I know I can. But this is his job. So he tries to be obedient, and for one year, that's what he does. And then what? After a year, he can't take it anymore. It burns in his bones. So he calls his home pastor. He said, I, I don't have any problem with my mission board, but I think I should just resign and just go out with a gospel tent here and try to preach. Pastor said, well, with your attitude like that, I'll support you. And if your other churches will help, we will take care of the support for you. And you may do that. And so they worked out after a lot of long distance calls, worked it all out. And with no bad attitude, he leaves the board and gets a tent and goes to a community and holds a tent meeting. And there are around 75 people saved in a three week meeting. Now that's a lot better than cutting grass when you go to Nashville to cut the grass. And so they used the tent then as a church place. And then after a while, they could get a building. And then what happens? They get a building, and they put the tent in another community, hold another meeting. Some towns, nobody saved. Other towns, 100, 120 people saved. And they, after a while, the Lord brings some Timothys in. So they start training these men, start the Bible school, and they become like co-pastors with a missionary. Now let's just jump forward a number of years. They have a boy's home, and they have a problem with water. And the Roman Catholic lady who's in charge of that sends them a notice, we're cutting off your water. And so the missionary goes and he pleads. He's a red-headed man. All he can do to hold his temper. And somehow God just said, I'll handle that for you. So he goes back and he says to his wife, she said, what are you going to do? We got 90 boys here, no water. Oh, we'll just drill a well. That's what they did in Georgia. He didn't know you didn't drill wells there. So he went to another part of that country, got well drillers, and they came. He thought we'll go down 100 feet and have a great well. Went 100 feet, no water. 200 feet, no water. 300 feet, no water. 350, no water. Hit bedrock. The well driller, who was skeptical of all of it, said, uh, you'll never get water here. I've never got water in a place like this. Never. And you owe me, you know, I think it was around $1,000. I want my money. I'm pulling out my equipment. He said, just stop right where you are. My wife and I will go home and pray, and we'll tell you tomorrow what we want you to do. He went home. And he sent uh, faxes to his supporting churches and said, please have emergency prayer meetings. And they went to prayer. All night, it was a restless night. His wife had insisted to get off of his knees and get in bed and get some rest. But he prayed and wake, he didn't wake and sleep, wake and sleep, pray. And during the night, three times, it was like an audible voice, but there was no sound. Twenty more feet. 20 more feet. 20 more feet. Next morning, they drove into town, drove out of town, out to the site where they have this huge campus type ministry. A lot of activity thing going. And uh, he went to the well driller. He said, would you drill 20 more feet? He said, why? He said, well, God told me, drill 20 more feet. He said, I'll do it, but it was a waste of time. They drew 20 more feet. Nothing happened. Man was sick, sick. His wife was sick. And he said to the well driller, just stop, just stop. I'm going home, and we'll come back tomorrow, and we'll tell you. He said, yes, and bring your check. I want my money. I'm pulling out my equipment. He said, and I'm going to cap this well off just like you had water, and I'll be gone. It never was a man more defeated than this man. He went back home. Bob and Joan. Next morning, he said, I just don't want to go out there. She said, honey, we've got to go. We've got to go. So here they go. 
And this whole ministry is right there on the Pan American Highway. Like if you have a back east of Blue Ridge Parkway. Got this beautiful view for miles everywhere. And as they get close to the boys' home and the other ministers that are there, they notice that there's water running down the side ditches of the Pan American Highway. They get close to the boys' home, the whole front yard is flooded. We're talking about acres flooded. And he thought maybe the water tank the city had had burst. (laughs) He said, that'll fix that old woman. God busted their well, their water tower. God busted their water tower. But what had happened? They'd hit a mighty artesian well with enough water to supply a large city. And it was gushing up. (laughs) God! And 20 more feet. He just kept drilling. He just kept drilling. And the amazing thing is, the water was warm. And the boys were so excited, they said, we not only can get a shower, we got warm water. Isn't that amazing? My wife and I have traveled in dozens and dozens and dozens of countries. But everywhere except Canada and the U.S., we've had to have bottled water. Now there's a third place. They're in Honduras, where the artesian well is. I don't need any bottled water. It's all pure. My. The biggest problem most of us have, we just quit too soon. Wherever you're drilling, go back and drill 20 more feet. God is in charge. Father, how we thank you tonight for the testimonies we've heard last night, this morning, tonight, about the God of all sufficiency, the God of all grace, the God of all mercy. We're humble that we have been chosen to serve you. How we thank you that you can do that which no one else can do and do it in a way that a whole nation will have to say, God is at work. We think of the thousands who drive by the Pan American Highway They point to a location, and they say that's where God drilled a well. We pray for the cities in this state and the surrounding territory where there's no gospel witness, that in triumphant faith, there'll be some water boys that'll drill wells. In the Savior's name we pray, amen, amen.